time we have been living in. Who would have ever thought a few weeks or a few months ago that we would be in a time that the whole world would have shut down, that we would be confined to our homes, that the shelves in the supermarkets were empty. You can't find toilet paper anywhere. Who would have thought that that would have ever happened? I still don't understand that. Why would people be hoarding toilet paper? Who would have thought that in our country that you would have had to wait in lines to get into stores because there was a limit on how many people could get in. Who would have ever thought in our country that when you go into a bank, you got to wear a mask? Things are flipped around. It's just an unusual time that we've had. And then, as soon as that is about to come to an end, social injustice is exploding in our country. Rioting and looting are just going crazy. I never thought that there would be a time of, of, of this happening. So what's going on? What's, what is really happening in our country? See, here's what, I, here's what I believe. I believe that we are in a spiritual battle like we have never been before. Like some people think that that it's just about humans right now. But I'm telling you, the battle is more about principalities and powers that we can't see than we have ever, than, than you can ever imagine. The enemy that's in this battle that we're fighting, he would love for us to stay isolated, that we would stay in fear, that we would, that we would bring hatred into the world. But that is not God's plan. The enemy would, would like for us to be focused on ourselves and all the things that have been happening to us. But that's not God's plan. See, when we talk about the Bible and all through the Bible, there is a theme about how we should be serving others, how, lo how we should be loving others. But the enemy... The enemy is always wanting us to focus on, on me, on, on, on myself. What am I missing out on? How do I take care of number one? That's what the enemy wants me to be focused on. Think about this. The first sin that ever happened was in the garden in Genesis. In Genesis, if we'll look in Genesis 3, 1 through 6, this is the first sin that ever took place that caused the whole world that we live in now to be fallen. That, that caused the whole world that we live in right now to be full of despair, full of anguish, full of anxiety. Let's read that. It starts off and it says, The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat the trees from in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, said the serpent. You will be made like God, knowing both good and evil. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious. And she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. The first sin 
The first sin was all about what am I missing out on? What is God trying to keep from me? And the whole time, God was trying to keep something for them. God did not want us to live in a world that was full of sin and shame. It goes on to talk about how much shame came into the world. And God never intended on our lives being that way. What God intended on our lives being was being in a relationship with him in, in the most beautiful environment, walking and spending time with God. Because that's what was going on prior to sin. Daily, it says that God would come down and walk with Adam in the cool of the evening, spending time with him one-on-one, -on -one, the God of the universe. And that's exactly what God had intended for us. But, but mankind thought God was trying to keep something from him. And from that, you see, Adam and Eve's children, the jealousy arose between them and one brother killed another brother. See, that was never supposed to be the way God had designed it. That was only because of sin. And that same, that same power and principalities that was going on there that caused the woman to be tempted, that's what's going on in our world really today. It's not all those things that people are really fighting about. It's the enemy trying to destroy man's kind relationship because the Bible is pretty clear. God gave his people directions on how to real, real, live rightly. Uh, if, if you go on, down to Exodus. If we go into the next chapter of the Bible, there was a man that God chose to lead his people out of captivity that they had gotten themselves into in Egypt. His name was Moses. And, and God directed Moses to tell his people, here are 10 things that I want you to that I want you to share with your people. And if they do these 10 things, they'll be able to live rightly. It's called the Ten Commandments. The first one says, you shall have no other gods before me. Two, you should have, you shall make no, you shall not make idols. Three, you shall not take the name of the Lord God in vain. Number four, remember the Sabbath day. Number five is honor your mother and your father. Number seven is you shall not commit adultery. Number eight is you shall not steal. Nine, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And 10, you shall not covenant. See, the first of these commandments are all about how we spend our relationship with God. How, how do we live rightly with God? We gotta put God first because God it's, it's about our love relationship with the Father, the, the, the creator of the universe. That's what the first part of these Ten Commandments are. The last half of the commandments are how do we live with our neighbor. And, and, and as Jesus said, the first commandment is we should love God with all our heart, our soul, and our mind. And the second ones are just the same, that we should love our neighbor. The second part of these commandments, the, the second half of the commandments is all about how we should treat our neighbor. And think about that. If we didn't, if, if we honored our, our parents, if we, if we never murdered, if we, if we didn't commit adultery, if we didn't steal from our neighbor, if we didn't lie about our neighbor, we didn't covet what our neighbor has, what would that do to change the world? There's only one in there about us. And that's the hardest one for us to do. It says you just need to keep the Sabbath day holy. See, God gave us that day to rest. Because most of the time we get so caught up into us that we keep going and going and going. And then we get tired. And when we get tired, it's irritable. And we do things and we fall into temptations and we sin either against God or our brother. But what God was wanting us to do is, be, is, is to walk in a great relationship with him and our neighbors and our brothers and sisters in the world. Paul spent a lot of time, if we go on to the New Testament, about how to do that. He was telling the people in Corinth, hey, this is how you live with your brothers and sisters. 
And in 1 Corinthians, if we start in verse 10 and we go from 14 to 34, this is what Paul said to the, to the people in Corinth about how do you live in a great relationship with your brothers. He says, so my dear friends, free from the worship of idols. See, this was again, he was talking about what God says, don't worship other gods because there's only one true God in this world and that's the creator of the universe. That's And the only way to get into that relationship is through Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that no one knows the Father. No one comes to him except through Jesus. And Paul goes on and he says, you are reasonable people. Decide for yourselves if what I'm saying is true. When we bless the cup at the Lord's table, aren't we sharing in, in the blood of Christ? And when we ask, and when we break bread, aren't we sharing in the body of Christ? And though we are many, we all eat from one loaf of bread, showing that we are one body. Think about the people of Israel. Weren't they united by eating the, the sacrifices at the altar? What am I trying to say? Am I saying that food offered to idols has some significance or that idols are real gods? No, not at all. I am saying that these sacrifices offered to demons not to God, and I don't want you to participate with demons. You cannot drink from the cup of the Lord and from the cup of demons. Two, you can't, you can't eat at the Lord's table and eat at the table of demons, too. What? Do, do we dare to rouse the Lord's jealousy? Do you think we are stronger than he is? You say, I am allowed to do anything but not everything is good for you. You say, I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. Don't be concerned for your own good, but for the good of others. You may say, you may eat any meat that is sold in the marketplace without raising questions of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. If someone who isn't a believer asked you home for dinner, accept the invitation if you want to. Eat whatever is offered to you without raising questions of conscience. But suppose someone tells you that this meat is offered to idols. Don't eat it out of the consideration of the conscience of the one who told you. It might be a matter of conscience for you, but it is it might not be a matter of conscience for you, but it is a conscience for the other person. For my, for why should my freedom be limited by what someone else thinks? If I can thank God for the food and enjoy it, why should it be condemning? Why should I be condemning for eat it? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it for for do it all for the glory of God. Don't give offense to the Jews or Gentiles or the church of God. I too try to please everyone in everything I do. I don't just do what is best for me. I do what is best for others so that I'm so that many might be saved and that you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. See, Paul was saying here Look, I can go out, I can do anything that I want to do. And I, it might not be a sin in my life, but I may cause somebody else to stumble and fall. I might be able to eat anything. I might be able to drink anything. And that might not hinder my relationship with God, but it might cause somebody else to stumble. And Paul says, hey, look, don't do that. Think of others first. Think of others' salvation first. If you cause somebody else to stumble, how terrible would that be? Because we're all called to one mission. Our mission is to reach the world and have the world come into a relationship with the God Almighty through Jesus Christ. And Jesus' last words to Peter was all about serving others. In John 21, 15 through 17, 
He says, after breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep. And Jesus said a third time, he asked the question. He said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked him the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything and you know I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my sheep. See, the enemy wants us to, the enemy wants us to be focused on, on ourselves. What's good for me? How do I get the most out of life for me? And Jesus is the perfect example of how we're supposed to live our lives. See, Jesus never came to live a life here on earth for himself. Jesus said he didn't come to be served, but to serve. And as Christians, as followers of Christ, as imitators of Christ, we are supposed to portray that to the world. Our job is not to see what we can get for ourselves, but how can we go out and serve other people? How can we tell them about the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel message? And what causes the world to be messed up is for us to get focused on me, on, on what's good for me. What, how am I going to get all I can get for me? And if we all focused on what can I do for others? How can I serve my brothers and sisters? How can I help my brothers and sisters? What can I do? Not for me, but for others in the world. If we would take that stance, how would that change? How would it change how we treated everybody else? How would, it, how would that change ministry that we do? See, the enemy... Man, he wants you to be focused on you. He wants us to be filled with anger. He wants us to be filled with hate. He wants us to get focused inward instead of outward. But God, the Father, he gave his all for you. He stepped out of heaven and through the person of Jesus Christ, came to the earth to give his life so that you and I could have a relationship with God the Father. God gave his only son, and that whoever believed in him should be saved. Jesus stepped out of his place of authority, came to, came to earth, in the worst possible conditions and died in one of the worst possible ways possible and suffered because of the sin you and I created. And what he wants us to do is not be focused on, on myself, but how can I serve like Jesus did? How can I give my all like Jesus did? But we have to decide. We have to decide which side are we going to be on. Because I can tell you, as this spiritual battle heats up, there's not going to be fence walkers. You are going to be on one side or the other. You are going to have to make a decision. Am I going to follow God? Am I going to serve others? Am I going to put others first ahead of myself? Or am I going to be selfish? And am I going to be on the side of the enemy? And you're going to pick a side. You, you are not going to be lukewarm. The Bible tells us that, that God wants us to be hot or cold. Like he, he wants us to be all in or he wants us to be all out. Lukewarm is disgusting to him. It says he would spit that out of his mouth. And today you need to decide which side am I going to be on? Am I going to choose for life to be all about me, or am I going to choose for life to be all about Christ? And what can I do to spread the gospel message to people around the world?
And today's the day. Today's the day. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, today is the day to make that right. Today is the day to get that relationship correct because God in heaven wants to fellowship with you one-on-one. And, and, and today, it's an easy way to do that. The Bible tells us that if we'll believe in our heart and we'll confess with our mouth, that our sins will be forgiven. And I can tell you there's not a sin that you've ever done that will keep you away from the Father if you want to repent this morning. And what repenting means is I'm going to believe in my heart. I'm going to turn from the way I'm going to the opposite direction. And I'm going to, I'm going to transform my life from all about me to all about him. I'm going to let him take control of my life. And we do that through a simple prayer. And I want you, if you're ready to change your life, if you're ready to, 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 to walk away from anxiety, depression, from, from uh, the sinful life that's kept you trapped, from the anxiety and the fears that you may have had in your life, if you're ready to walk from that and walk in a new direction this morning, I want you to pray this prayer. I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Father God, I am a sinner. And I'm asking you to, to forgive me of my sins. I do believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. He died on the cross. And he rose from the dead to save me from my sins. Today, I'm asking you to become Lord of my life. Take control, Jesus. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we want to celebrate with you. If you made that commitment this morning, if this is the first time that you've made that commitment, or maybe you, you had made that commitment and you walked away from that relationship, but you've made that right again this morning, we want to celebrate with you. And, and below, you will see a link that you can email us at. And we want to celebrate with you. We want to put a team of people around you to help you keep walking in the right direction. We want, we want people to come around you that will pray for you, that will, that will help you separate yourself from the enemy and continue in the right direction. So contact us so we can celebrate with you. We want to, we've got something special for you. So the next thing is, serving others. If you're ready to step out of your comfort zone and serve others like never before, we want to help you do that as a church. We need your help. We have a huge mission in the area that we're in, and we need you to partner with us. We need you to start helping us serve others so this morning, if you're ready to change your life, if you're ready to start serving in a deeper relationship, if you're ready to start serving in a deeper way, again, contact us at the email below or direct message me because we want and we need your help and we want to put you in a position that, that God wants to use all your gifts and talents to serve other people. We've got lots of areas. We've got lots of ways we can plug you in and I can tell you when you do that, God blesses you more than you can ever think. And he starts opening up all these possibilities of dreams and visions that he wants to do through you and give you even greater responsibilities and greater blessings in your life. But it all starts with being a willing vessel this morning. I know that God loves you and that God wants to be the the hope and the truth in your life. And that God has a greater plan for your life than you can ever think or imagine. He's just waiting on you to be a willing vessel to step into all those things that he wants to do through you. And I can't wait to hear the testimonies of what starts happening in your life when you start serving others in a greater way because things Things just manifest in your life like you could never imagine. And it's going to be amazing. So contact us. We want to get you plugged in. We, we, want, we want to see things just explode in your life. I want to see the best for you. But before we go, 
I want to pray a prayer over you. I want to pray this prayer that God told Moses to have Aaron pray over the people and that when Aaron did this, God would bless them too. It says, may the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. And whenever Aaron and his sons bless the people of Israel in my name, I will bless them too. God wants to bless you today. 